Hi, everybody. Now we're going to do a kind of a review of the basic ideas and probability that we're going to need for the course. Um, this is kind of a build up to the idea of likelihood, um, because in many uh, machine learning situations, uh, one way to measure how accurately you are able to predict or model a phenomenon is to um, think of it in, in, in a way where the behavior is governed by probability, and then you try to choose um, uh, a model for it, which is most, it gives the most likely explanation for the data. But that's all going to come later. For now, let's just start with, uh, with some of the basics and the terminology of probability theory. So probability begins with a set Um, called a sample space. I'll draw a picture of it. Here it is. This is X, and X is called a sample space. And the idea that you should think of is that X, we're doing an experiment, and X is the collection of all possible results of our experiment. And in fact, the, you can think of the elements of X, possible elements of X are called outcomes. And an event is a subset U of our sample space X. So it's a collection of outcomes. And we have, together with the sample space, we have a function P, a probability function, P, which goes from the power set of X to the real numbers, actually not to all real numbers, but to the interval from 0 to 1. And it measures how P of a set, P of an event, is how likely is U. So uh, P equals 0 means doesn't happen. P equals 1 means always happens. And P in 0, 1 means is a measure how, how likely the event is to actually occur. What it exactly means is a question for philosophers. You may have your own feeling about what it means to say that an event has a 60% probability of occurring. Um, but uh, I'm not actually going to get into that. We'll just think of it as a measure of, certainly we think that a 0.8 probability event is much more likely to occur than a 0.2 like, likelihood event. Um, and um, so our probability, and I should make maybe make one other remark, which is that this is not really true. Uh, the function really, if x is complicated, like if x is the real numbers, it's not really a function from the power set of x. So this is what you might call a naive probability function. And for those of you that have, are experts or have studied measure theory, you'll know that this is not true. But um, to all intents and purposes, it's going to work for us. So um, uh, the, uh, the main axiom that this probability function has to satisfy is that if you have a collection of events which are disjoint, meaning that they, they're di completely different outcomes, then the probability that one of those things occurs is the sum of the probability that each of them occurs separately. And so to make this more concrete, we can look at a few sort of classic examples. So the first example is coin flipping. And the, um, the sample space consists of two things, heads and tails. And the probability function, the, there's only four events. The empty set, heads, tails, or heads or tails. And we know that the probability of this is 0 and the probability of this is 1, uh, because those are actually axioms, I should say, that the probability of the 
entire sample space is 1. That means some event is always likely to occur. And the probability of the empty set is 0. That means the chance that nothing happens is 0. And here, so this is P. Here's U. And here's P of U. Uh, probability of the empty set is 0. The probability of heads we'll call P. The probability of tails has to be 1 minus P. And um, <coughs> the probability of heads and tail or tails is 1. This relationship is forced by the fact that since heads and tails are disjoint and their union is the whole set, their probabilities have to sum to 1. And uh, a fair coin situation is the situation, of course, where P would be 1 half. Uh, another example might be X is the set of rolls of two dice. So X consists of a pair, for example, of a dice with one and a dice with one, or a dice with one and a dice with two, and so on. It has 36 total elements because there are six possibilities for the first and six for the second. And we can say that the probability of any particular roll is all the same. So the chance of getting a two ones, a one followed by a one, is the same as the chance of getting a three followed by a five. Um, but then we could also ask, what is the probability that the sum, and of course, this maybe this point here is fine because now, since there are 36 total elements, if you sum up the probability of all the possible events, you sum 1 over 36, 36 times, and you get 1. Now, what about the probability that the sum of the dice is 5? Well, to get a sum of 5, you would have to roll a 1 and a 4, a 2 and a 3, a 3 and a 2, or a 4 and a 1. So the, that, the event that you're interested in looks like this. If that's the subset of the sample space. And the probability of that event is 4 out of 36, or 1 ninth. Um, now, uh, this is when you're dealing with finite sets of out, finite sample spaces, and you're dealing with, then, then probability theory is very closely related to combinatorics, and the question is about sums and, and things like that. Um, but there's a more uh, sophisticated idea, which is as I'm where your sample space is um, a continuous set like the real numbers. So let's consider the following experiment, situation, experiment. X is the real numbers. Uh, so the sample space, uh, a measurement, is a real number. So you could think of this as we measure the temperature using a thermometer, which like all thermometers is error prone. So the true temperature is, let's say, T0. And the, when we, the measurements are t0 plus x, where x is in the real numbers. So our outcomes are the deviations from the two temperatures in our measurement. And how do we describe the distribution in this case, since it's we can't just, uh, there's, there's uh, uncountably many possible outcomes. We do it by giving a distribution function. So instead of giving a probability function, we give a probability density which is a function on the real numbers. And then we define the probability of the event u, where u is a subset now of our, of our um, 
sample space, so u is an event, <clears throat> the probability of u is the integral over that set u of the probability density. And you can think about this. This, this is the chance that our measurement lands in u. And so if u is an interval, let's say it's the interval from minus delta to delta for some delta not equal to 0, then the probability of u is the integral from minus delta to delta of p of x dx. And probably the most famous and important probability density uh, is the normal distribution. And it's defined by the following formula. P sigma of x is 1 over sigma times the square root of 2 pi times, uh, sorry, no integral sign, times e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma squared. And here sigma is a parameter called the standard deviation. And um, if you graph this function, I'm sure you've seen it before, you get a bell curve type shape. And how pointy it is depends on sigma. If, um, if sigma is um, large, then the curve is sort of spread out. And if sigma is small, then it's very spiky. And what that means is that the, if the sigma is small, then the probability that x is near 0 is large because the integral, if here's the picture for sigma small, the chance that, you're, that x is near 0 is this big area, whereas if sigma is large and the curve goes something like this, then um, the chance that you're close to the origin is a much smaller percentage of the total area. And of course, the reason, whoops, the reason for this uh, 1 over square to 2 pi, 1 over sigma square to 2 pi in the front, is to make sure that the axiom is satisfied that p of x is 1, p of r, which is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of p of x dx, is actually equal to 1. And that's where that normalizing constant comes from. So um, it would be very typical to, if we were making measurements, if we were making uh, temperature measurements using a thermometer, it would be very typical for our uh, results to be distributed around the, tr the true um, value. So the error would be sort of clustered near 0. And the variance of our results, or the standard deviation of our results, uh, would tell us how good our thermometer is. If the standard deviation is small, so that the value, so that you're much more likely to be near zero, that means the errors tend to be small. And if uh, the standard deviation is big, it means that your errors are spread out all over the place. So um, that's our very basic look at um, discrete and continuous probability. And we're going to move on from here to talk about um, some other features of this theory.